the symbolic dynamics and uh, coding in uh, disk drives. And uh, I'm going to issue a disclaimer from the outset of this uh, talk. Uh, and my mathematics colleagues will be disappointed because I'm, I've basically removed all math from this <laughs> talk uh, and uh, you know, to make it accessible to everybody. So uh, the other, the second disclaimer is that uh, my presentation is actually uh, going back in time. So I'm going to start from today and go back in time. Um, this uh, theory of uh, symbolic dynamics was uh, introduced uh, hundred, more than a hundred years ago. And uh, at the time it was not quite clear why one would be interested in this, but today uh, it's much easier to justify this, uh, the existence and even the development of, of this theory. So here's a brief overview of the expose. Um, first, I'm going to talk about coding. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, how we can encode and uh, decode information from uh, floppy and hard disk drives. I'll talk about frequency modulation, which is uh, just a coding scheme. Uh, the uh, modified frequency modulation, which is a slight improvement over the frequency modulation scheme. Then I'll relate this very briefly to shifts of finite type. So there's a little bit of math there. Uh, and uh, the theory of languages. That's the mathematical theory of languages. Then uh, I'll talk about uh, the Cantor set and uh, some of his uh, friends. And uh, finally, I'll come to uh, dynamical systems, where it actually all started. So I'll talk about the tent map. It's just a one a very special dynamical system. It has nice features, so that's why I'm going to talk about this one. And perhaps, if time permits, I'll uh, talk about uh, iterated function systems and fractals. Um, I'm interested in that last uh, theory, uh, but uh, I'm not even going to uh, dare to talk about what I'm doing in that direction because it's, it's simply too, too advanced. Um, so let's just start by talking about uh, uh, how we code, so encode and decode information in art disk drives. You probably all know that computers store data in sequences of zeros and ones. So the zeros and ones are called zeros and ones are called uh, bits because uh, this comes from uh, binary digits. So you have the B and Yes. Uh, and uh, this is well known. And uh, you may even have heard about the ASCII code. The ASCII code is used to um, encode some uh, either you know uh, letters or numbers, the so number zero to nine, or punctuation or control symbols. They're encoded using. Uh, Bits. So actually, more precisely, a sequence of eight bits, which is usually called a doctrine or a byte. But what is less known is people believe, most people believe, that the way that we encode them is just by going verbatim. So we just take the code, so say the number zero corresponds to 48. 48 is written as its binary uh, expansion and uh, we use that binary expansion to just encode it just as it is. But for some uh, practical considerations, uh, the way that information is encoded is slightly more complicated and that's what I want to discuss. So first I've got to explain a little bit how uh, our, well, floppy and hard disk drives work. Uh, so, 
The disk drives, they consist of one or more platters. They are sp spinning platters. And each of these uh, platters is coated with uh, a magnetic medium. And the, the platters, they spin, and they consist of different tracks. So you have, you know, a, a bunch you can think of the even though this is not a floppy or hard disk drive, if you look at a, a compact disk, it's a bit similar. Sometimes you can, if you look at it in, with the right angle, you can see some of the tracks on the, on the disk. So the tracks are they're just, they're all concentric and they're circular. And you have uh, an electrical and right, <coughs> sorry, read right head that is uh, floating. Uh, just above the, the track, so it's actually, you know, there's a thin cushion of air. Uh, it's very, very thin. It's about one hundredth of uh, the width of, uh, of a hair. And it's floating over this. And it reads and it writes, so depending on which uh, state you want to put it in. It's going to read and write over the tracks in question. How does it do that exactly? Well. Uh, let's start by saying how data is written on the, on the tracks. So the way it works is that you've got your uh, electrical head and there is, when you want to write it, there is some current that is sent into the head and in order to write something on the track, you're going to reverse current. Okay, so your track is consists of a magnetic medium, so you can magnetize it and by reversing current, what happens is that you, <coughs> you, uh, you create a magnet on the track. So it's a very, usually very, very small. You can't even see it, of course, with your eye. But it's a, it's a bar magnet that is created. And every single time that you reverse current, then you create a new bar magnet. So that's the way that you can write information. And usually what happens is that you have... Here's how we write information. So, say that we start with these data. So, what happens is you, you type a key on, on your uh, keyboard, your computer's keyboard, and uh, you get the corresponding uh, ASCII code, so it's a binary code, and say that what uh, comes up is can be uh, written using your binary expansion can be written in this one. So you read 0101000110110. Then what happens is <coughs> you've got a certain uh, current that is enacted there, and each time that you see a 1, you're going to reverse current. When you see a 0, nothing happens. The current is left as it is. But whenever you see a 1, you reverse current. So here we see a first one, it reverses current, it continues, it. you see a zero, nothing happens, a one is red, so it reverses current, and so on. So that's what you get has the, the right current here. And therefore what happens on the, on the track is that the, the magnetic medium will be magnetized in the following way. So. <coughs> Here I started with a magnet uh, that has its north pole here. So when you reverse current, you create a, a new magnet with uh, starting with the north pole. And of course at the other end you will find the south pole. The south pole is going to be created, so the end of the magnet will be created when you reverse current. So once you reverse current, then uh, comes the creation of a new magnet, and you keep on going like this. So that's the way that you can write on tracks, okay, on this uh, magnetic track. Now, how can you later read the information in question? Of course, what you're going to do is you're going to reverse the, the process. So what you want to look at, clearly, is you try to determine where they are polarity reversals. So <coughs> where you know the magnets the magnets they sort of collide together, so the two samples. 
you have a polarity, uh, polarity reversal there, and you want to read this. So what happens is that you know you have a magnetic field in there, and when there is a polarity reversal, this creates uh, a voltage. So there's a voltage pulse that can be read in there, and therefore you're going to see that because you created when you when you wrote the data on the on the track. It was written at the, at the precise moment where you were reading a one, so you created that uh, reverse polarity there. When you read the reversal, the polarity reversal, you're going to see a, a voltage pulse that will take place, and you'll be able to say, so here you have the, the pulses. Uh, so in this case, you know, from south to south, you get this pulse, from north to north, another pulse here, and different pulses like this. And whenever you see a pulse, you write, you say, okay, this is a one. You know, it's just a one-to-one -to -one correspondence that you get. So you can read, again, the, the data. Um, and at least that's theoretically what's happened. Of course, in practice, it's slightly more complicated than that. So what can happen? <coughs> is the following. If you have too many ones stuck together here, you have a series of pulses that, uh, that happen very, very quickly, and they may be hard to detect. The, so there are two, uh, mainly two problems with this. If you wanted to code the information verbatim, uh, when you have ones that are too close, you have pulses that are really, really close, so they may be really hard to detect. That's one reason. The other reason is that uh, from a physical point of view, if you look at the magnetic field, uh, the magnetic lines in there, if they're too close, if the magnets are too close, the magnetic lines, they, they sort of cancel each other. And what this has for impact is that the, the, the weaker the magnetic field is, the weaker the pulse is, and therefore the harder this pulse is to detect. The other thing is that because the lines, they tend to, they tend to cancel, but in some other places they add up in some way, so the, it's as if it, it slightly <coughs> shifts the, the pulse in time. So that makes, again, the detection uh, more difficult to do. Uh, on the one end, and maybe if it's, too, it's, if it's shifted too much to the left or to the right, then you may read it, read the pulse at the wrong moment, which means that you would get an error in the, when you decode the information. So the, these are two, <coughs> this is one of the main problems. The, the other problem is what we call the, the clock drift. The clock drift is uh, the following, you know that the, the Internally, in the computer, there is a clock. Now, <coughs> to determine when the pulses take place, you need to have, to have an idea of the time. Set the clock as many times as possible. And resetting the clock can be simply done physically. It can be done when you read the pulse. When the pulse is read, you can send a message to the clock and say, OK, reset the clock. You know, it's, it's a little bit like uh, as if, you know, uh, there was a, a, a rainstorm out there and you want to listen to the thunder. And you want to determine the time between uh, two times in a row that you hear the thunder. Well, you know, if every single time you're going to reset your clock, but then the time slowly it starts drifting. The, the more time it takes between the two the two uh, sounds to reach you, the more it's difficult to calculate the time. You start calculating, so one second, there's two seconds, three seconds, and so on. But, of course, initially you're pretty good at counting seconds, but as you add up, then the problem is that your, your approximations are, are becoming less and less accurate. So this is the reason why you want to avoid this clock drift and you want to reset the time as many times as you can. So it's associated with the presence of a one. With the presence of a pulse and the presence of a one. <coughs> so you have two effects that you must combine together. 
you don't want you don't want to have too many ones together because that means that you have lots of pulses that can be confused. But on the other hand, you want to have uh, sufficiently enough of ones in order to be able to avoid the clock drift, so an error in the calculation of time. And this is why we don't take the, the, the old sequence verbatim, but we start adding some bits in there. So this is where comes this uh, idea of looking at uh, the frequency modulation. Maybe I can start with uh, an example here. So say that I want to write the following. So that I go with uh, the following uh, octet. It's uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1. So in the frequency modulation, just a coding scheme. And what you do in that coding scheme is very simple. You're going to add a 1 each time you read uh, a bit. So you start from the outset. You decide you write a 1. I'm just going to, to distinguish the original ones with the added ones, I'm going to put a, bar under uh, the ones that are added. So you start with one that you have, you read the one, then you add the one, you read your zero, <coughs> so you put zero, then you put the one, you read the second zero, you put the one, you read your zero, you put the one, read the one, put the one, read the second one, put the one again, read the zero, Put your one and finally write your one. So it's a very basic coding scheme. And of course, knowing the coding, you're going to be able to not only encode but decode later on. The advantage of doing this here is that you avoid one of the two effects that I was describing a moment ago. The clock drift is avoided because you're sure to reset your clock every two bits. But of course there's a downside to this. You start with here uh, eight bits and you need to you need 16 to encode it. So it's very nice because you avoid the clock, the clock drift but on the other hand you need more space on your disk, on your track to code that information. Well, <coughs> then what can you possibly do to uh, get something better than this? You can modify it slightly. So that's what we call the modified frequency modulation scheme. And here's what you do in that case. So you're going to put you're going to add uh, a zero unless you see two zeros in one. So if you see two zeros, you're going to add a one instead. So here I start from, from the left. So uh, I'm adding a zero from the outset. I put my one here. Now I'm reading <coughs> that the next one is a zero. So that means that according to this scheme, I should add a zero. Then I can put my zero. This is a zero here. Now I want to read the next one. So I have two zeros in a row, which means that I must add a one. Now I can put my zero. And <coughs> again, if I, I read zero, zero, so I must have a one in between with my zero. And I can read here zero, one, so I'm going to have a zero. I can put my one. One, one means I have a zero in between my two ones. One, zero means I have a zero again. So I forgot to put my added. 
I add the, the zero before by zero, and finally the zero, uh, zero one. So I had the zero, and I put by one. So in this scheme, what we can say is it can be proved mathematically that you're going to have at most, if you look at this stream of of uh, bits here. Uh, you will notice one thing, if you take uh, adjacent ones, they can, they can be separated by some zeros, but they will be separated by at most three zeros. And in any case, you cannot have one followed by one, because you know, if, you have one, uh, if you have one followed by one in, in here, uh, you would have to introduce the zero between them. So this scheme achieves, uh, allows us to avoid uh, the two main problems I was uh, describing a moment ago. So the clock drift in, in one, on the one hand, because you know that uh, at least every four bits, you're going to reset the clock. Okay? Because you can have only three zeros. Keep in mind the ones are the, one, uh, are the symbols that reset the clock. So you know that you, you can avoid the clock drift in this way. And <coughs> the other thing is that you know that you have at least one zero between two ones. So again, you can avoid to uh, have too many uh, consecutive pulses. So you know this interference that I was talking about can be avoided uh, using that scheme here. OK, so once again, uh, here, this one has this advantage over that one here. Uh, moreover, it has another advantage. Uh, of course, you have, if you look at the two, uh, the two uh, codes that we've got here for this original uh, octet, uh, you have exactly the same number of bits. You have twice the original number of bits. But there's a terrific advantage to this one here. <coughs> Namely, because you know that your pulses, they cannot happen too close together, you can make sure that on your track, when you create a magnet, you can reduce the space needed for each magnet. So in reality, when you look at the, at the space needed on the track to code this, these 16 bits, it requires actually half of what is necessary to code with the original frequency modulation. <coughs> so that's a terrific advantage because you just need half of the space. That gives you twice, twice as much data that you can squeeze in on a single disk. So this is basically the idea of how we can code and encode information. And this is, uh, this is just an application of symbolic dynamics here. But really, symbolic dynamics was created a very long time ago. It, uh, it, uh, it, had, it appeared for the first time at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and let me just uh, now start going back in time and have a look at one of the most important sets in mathematics. And I'll make a link with uh, what we've done a moment ago. So the famous uh, Cantor set. Cantor is, uh, was a German mathematician. And uh, he is, incidentally he went on developing the theory of sets, which is a very, very deep theory. He did so, uh, interestingly, while he spent some of his some time in a psychiatric hospital. So uh, <laughs> it's interesting to note that. But, he was a terrific mathematician, and in uh, 1883, he came up with the following construction. So you start with the interval 0 to 1, and this is what we call the zeroth uh, level of this uh, construction. And what you're going to do is you're going to remove the middle third of the interval. So in this case, the middle third goes from 1 third to 2 thirds, you remove it, so that leaves you 2 sub-intervals, so two smaller intervals, because you've removed the middle third, of course that leaves you two intervals with length one-third each. 
and you repeat this forever. So at the next uh, level, you have C1 here that consists of the two intervals of left one pair. To get the second level of the construction, you're going to take each interval here and you're, you're going to remove its middle third. So you end up with four intervals, of course, every interval is split into two, so you get four intervals of length, a third of uh, what was the original interval, so the interval at the previous level, so a third of one third is one length, and you get these four intervals here. And you can keep on, you, you keep on going like this, and at the end you take uh, the intersection, or if you want the, the limit, and there will still be some points remaining in, in there. Now the points that will remain in there, there's no there's no interval that links them. Okay? Eventually, every two points will be separated okay? because there's a split that must happen between the two points. So uh, this set can be shown to have very, very nice properties uh, mathematically. And it's one of the most important sets in, in mathematics. Um, <coughs> It's studied from many different viewpoints, and in particular from the viewpoint of dynamics. So where is the dynamics in there, exactly? Of course, there's something happening, but you can ask, what is the link with what I've done there? So we can look at it a bit more formally in the following way. I just took another construction, forget about the small Forget about the theorem that is written there. Um, so here is a similar construction. But what really matters overall in Cantor's construction is that you have, you take one interval on the left and one interval on the right. So you, you remove at every level, you remove a central interval. That's what really matters in the construction. And therefore, here, if you think about it, what you've got is a left interval and a right interval. So you have L and R that I used, letters L and R, is because, just because it makes sense to use them. But think about it. It's 0 and 1. So it's just like this. And you repeat this at every level. So if I go from this interval that I call JL for, for some reason, I use the letter J. J stands for Julia, uh, who was another French mathematician, and he studied a similar type of sets. Uh, so if you take the left part of that interval, then you're going to add an L, so you get JLL. And whereas if you take the right part of that interval, you add an R, so you get JLR. And if you can keep on going like this, you see that each interval is coded. It's coded by what we call a word, a word of length 2 in this case. So LR, and at the third level, you have words of length 3, LRR, for instance, or RLR. And you can keep on going like this. So what happens is, in the end, you can show that the points that are in the modified Cantor set, uh, they, can, they have an address, they have a single address, but of course it's an infinite address because you've got to keep on going forever. So to end up at a the, at the certain point, um, if I give you the example, to take a very simple example, say that we start from zero, the only way that you can end up with the point zero is by always taking left. So that's really the only way you can end up with zero. If you start here, okay, there's no choice. Here you must choose left because if you choose right, you're going to end up with a point in the rightmost interval. So the same argument repeats over and over again. So zero as for address, L, 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 and so on. So L infinity, if you want. Same thing, one would have R infinity as a code. And you can keep on going like this. <coughs> so if you want, to, for instance, to find, uh, say that this is the number one third in the, in the middle Cantor set, that would be the number one third, you would have to take left first and then choose right all the time. 
So you get L and R infinitely many times, indefinitely. Uh, and that would be the address of that number. And you, keep, you can keep on, you can do this for every single point in the Cantor set. So that's where you go from a physical problem, where of course, you know, if you use a, if you use a track, a, a disk, you have a finite quantity of information that you can store in there, so finitely many data. Where you go to a mathematical construction, and in this case you end up with, with infinitely many at every, uh, at every uh, stage you must make a choice, so you get infinitely many coordinates in your address, rather than just finitely many of them. Okay, so uh, why is this interesting exactly? Well, for many different reasons. Um, I will concentrate only on the dynamics here. But you can do similar constructions, and I'm sure that some of you have already seen some of them. So this one is, uh, there are two versions. Let's, let's just have a look at the left one here. So the idea is, this one is called the von Koch curve. It's a Swedish uh, mathematician who introduced it. And what he did basically was to remove the middle third, but replace it by the other two sides of what would be an equilateral triangle. And then you repeat this at all stages. And what you get in the end, if you, if you look at this, so in the end, in the limit, if you repeat this indefinitely, you get what we call the Funko curve. But you know, if you, if you were to uh, take these parts here and put them together, what you would get is something that looks like a snowflake. And here, this is something, something uh, uh, slightly different because here, there is some random choices that are made. This is what is the, really the subject of um, current research. You introduce some random aspects and some probabilities and so on that, that, uh, that uh, mess up a little bit the, uh, the structure, but nevertheless, it retains overall what we call the fractal structure. The same thing can be done. You can use some, uh, some maps and create Believe it or not, you can use, you can use uh, three maps in two dimensions. And if you use them correctly, you can create a third like this. And in fact, there's, a, there's a, an advanced theorem in, in the theory that says whatever object you have in mind, you can construct it using some, some maps if you, if you do them. If you do this correctly, you'll be able to construct any object. Okay, so why is this really interesting? Well, <coughs> ah, maybe I'll show you one last one. Here's a, another construction, and I can talk about the coding in there. So if you start here, you have what we call, from the top, we have uh, what we call <coughs> the Sierpinski uh, gas cap. So you start with a triangle and uh, you remove the middle triangle at every stage. And again, it's possible, it's easy to code information. So if you call uh, one the, uh, the lower left triangle, one the, by two the lower right triangle, and by three the, the upper triangle, again, if you repeat this indefinitely, you're going to have a coding with one, two, and three and each point will be coded with an infinite address. Same thing can be done with uh, starting with a square rather than a triangle. If you remove the middle square, um, what you're going to end up with is called a Sierpinski carpet. It's a carpet, and uh, it, ha it has holes everywhere. So there's no, uh, it has holes everywhere. Let's put it in these terms. Okay, there are more exotic stuff like, uh, you know, what we call Julia sets. So you get very, very nice pictures. Uh, but this is a bit more advanced. This, this is in complex dimensions. Okay, now I'm coming to uh, the point where this all really started. So that's, that's essentially there by, uh, if you want, my uh, scientific ancestor. 
uh, Poincaré, a well-known French mathematician. And uh, towards the end of the 19th century, he introduced what we call a dynamical system. So what is a dynamical system? Well, it uh, consists of two things. You start with the set, x, and you have a function that maps x into x. And what you're going to do is, uh, you're going to apply f first time. You're going to end up at a certain point. And you're going to keep on applying f like this, and you will want to see what is the ultimate behavior of some points. So just to give you an, uh, an example, let's start with something very, very simple. If, uh, if I take, everybody can, can see this easily, say that I start with, uh, say that I start with the following function, f of x is equal to 2x. Um, so, if x is uh, 0, there's a slight exception. When x equals 0, you have f of 0 is 0. So you stay at 0. Therefore, you can apply f as many times as you wish, but you will always be at 0. So for this reason, we call uh, 0, it's called a fixed point. Now let's have a look at what happens with other numbers. I used to do this when I was in high school. I was fascinated by using my calculator. I was entering a number, usually one, and then I multiplied by two, and then I was pressing the equal button. And you can imagine what was happening. So if you start from one, you multiply by two, you get two. And the two now is going to be multiplied by two, so you get four. The 4 is, upon application of f again, the 4 is multiplied by 2, so you get 8. 8 becomes 16, 16, 32, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, and so on. So it's going to infinity. It explodes. If you start with a negative number, you're also going to infinity, but along the negative part of the axis. Okay, so it's negative infinity in this case, but uh, the behavior is uh, similar, at least for, for some reason, mathematicians see this as the uh, similar behavior. So if you, one way to see this visually is the following. You uh, start uh, with your uh, x and y coordinates. Uh, of course, I'm going to put uh, f of x uh, along the y coordinate, and you draw the diagonal line. So this is the line where y is equal to x. Now, the graph of this function is 2x. So the graph of my function, sorry, I don't have any other color, but the graph of my function is okay. I don't want to use, uh, for some reason, I don't want to use dashes. But that's going to be the graph of my function. Of course, uh, y equals f of x here. And of course, the slope is twice what it was for the other one, so it's rising faster. So say that you start with a certain number, whatever it is. I'll take a positive one, so x is 0. And if I go to my diagonal <coughs> line, the point uh, there that I'm going to get has four co coordinates, x0, zero, x0, zero, of course. Same coordinates along the x and y. But let's continue. Let's apply our function. Applying the function means that we should go to the graph of our function. There we go. So we start from, from this point here. We're going to the graph of our function. So we end up at the point, of course, x, uh, x0. I'll just do it once. x0, f of x0. OK. <coughs> now. I would like to reapply f once again, because you know that's what dynamical systems are about. It's about iterating, so applying over and over again the function f. So to apply it again, here's what I can do. I'm just going to go horizontally to my diagonal line. And I'm going to end up at the point 
Now, here, y doesn't change because I'm going horizontally. So f of x0 is my y coordinate, but it's also my x coordinate. So how can I apply from this point? Uh, I am at the value of x is f of x0. So if I want to apply f again, I just need to go to my graph. Graph of my function. And I end up here. And I continue going on, going on like this. So horizontally, vertically, horizontally, vertically, and you see what's happening. We're going out of the patient by iterates, the different values, they go, they're going to infinity. If you start from zero, just like I did initially, you stay at zero because the two lines intersect there. So you're stuck there. So this is why you have a fixed point. So zero is set to zero. And you stay there forever. If you start from a negative number, then you're going to go like this. That. And you're going to minus infinity. So this is a very simple one. OK, so there is more complicated, of course. And let's just have a look at one of them. I'm going to look at the famous one, the one that I pronounced, the tech map, for some reason. So here is the tech map. And the tech map, I think you all understand why we call it the tech map, it's because its graph looks like a tent. And uh, you have the exact expression as a function, so it's a function that is defined piecewise. Uh, it has two pieces, so the, first, the left piece here, this piece, is just uh, 3x, uh, where x uh, is less than or equal to 1 half, and the right part is uh, 3 minus 3x, uh, that's when x is greater than or equal to 1 half, so that's why at, here at 1 half, the two uh, parts, uh, they uh, mesh together at the summit, at the vertex of the, of the tent. So what happens if you do the, the dynamics with this one? Well, let's see. Okay. So here's what happens if you start with a negative number. So x0 is negative. You start, you go vertically to your graph, horizontally, vertically, horizontally, vertically and you're going to minus infinity. So very similar to what was happening there a moment ago. Okay, so what happens if we start from a point not to the left of zero, but rather to the right of one. To the right of one, you go vertically to your graph, and then horizontally, and oh, we end up to a negative number, so from this point on, the behavior is uh, the behavior of the iterates will be the one that was adopted for all negative numbers, so it's going to minus infinity. So what the, for us, uh, for dynamicists, uh, it's not really interesting to know that it's going to minus infinity, or for that matter, to plus infinity. It's when there's something weird that happens that we really get interested. So let's keep on going. So we know what's happening to the left of 0 and to the right of 1. Now let's see what's happening if we start between 1 third and 2 thirds. So here's a, another starting value, uh, x0 double bar. So you go to your graph, go horizontally. Notice that your graph is bringing you outside of this uh, square here. So you're going above 1. And because you're going above 1, you end up to the right of 1. And from this point on, you know that you're going to go to minus infinity. So you're still going to minus infinity, but with the, a delay, a longer delay before you're going there. Notice the numbers, 1 thirds and 2 thirds. So they are reminiscent of the first level of the construction in the Cantor set. So in between one-third and two-thirds, 
we are not, personally as mathematicians, we are not interested in what's happening in between because we know that it's just going to minus infinity. It's not too important. So you can keep on going like this. Now the picture is becoming blur, but uh, let's see if I can match this one. Uh, something like this. So, here I started with something between one ninth and two ninths, and I take, uh, I start from that value, I go to my graph horizontally, and you see the way that I constructed it, I just, uh, from that point on, I'm just taking the green, uh, the green uh, <coughs> trajectory, and I'm going to minus infinity. So, between one, half, uh, one ninth and two ninths, as well as in between seven ninths and eight ninths, we're not much interested in these because we know that the iterates are going to minus infinity. So what are the points? Ultimately, I could keep on going like this, but what are the points that are going to remain in that square in there? So upon iteration, their dynamics will, they will move, but they will stay always within the square. Well, these are the points that coincide with the Exactly, the, the points that lie between, uh, that lie in the intervals of the construction of the Cantor set. So when you take the intersection, these are exactly the points of the Cantor set. So the Cantor set is really the set of points where we are interested in the dynamics for this map. And this is what is really amazing. So you had a construction. Cantor came up with a construction that was completely set theoretical. He knew nothing at the time about dynamics because it didn't even exist at the time. And then suddenly people started doing dynamics, like Poincaré, for instance. He introduced dynamics. People started doing dynamics, and they realized, oh, oh the sets of interest, so what we call the limit sets or the attractors or in some cases, the Julia sets, they really like, they look like the Cantor set. So in general, they share a lot of the features of the Cantor set. And this is why the Cantor set became so, so important. So I could look at other dynamical systems, and you would ultimately come up with a set of points where the dynamics is interesting, where the dynamics is chaotic, that's what we're interested in, chaos. Um, because, you know, we're interested in chaos because it's difficult to control, of course. So, um, the sets where you have chaos are really, really weird sets, just like the Cantor set. So, these sets are called fractals, following uh, a term that was coined by uh, Mandelbrot. And <coughs> uh, perhaps I can just give you a hint to what I'm interested in personally. So here the thing is, if you keep in mind what we've said about the, all these sets, you, had or, you always had a coding, but the coding was given by a finite number of digits. Okay, so you had, in, in the, the original case, we had the bits 0 and 1, so we have only two symbols to code the information. In some cases, like uh, you remember the, the triangle, so what we call the Sierpinski gasket, we had, we were removing the middle triangle, so we had three of them left, so we needed three letters or three symbols to code those. So what is uh, of interest uh, right now in this field is to do it, but this time with infinitely many of them. So that's one of the trends. So uh, this here is just a representation. I don't want to explain uh, too much here. What is happening is, for those who know, it's, it's all taking place in what we call the complex plane. Um, it's in two-dimensional space. You can see it this way. And you have, inf you have in fact, uh, infinitely many maps. So you have infinitely many symbols to code the information. And therefore, the kind of picture that you get is something like this. So you have all these, uh, all these circles. They're, they're mapped to different circles. And uh, you get the following uh, type of pattern. 
and this is repeated. So you go, that's the, if you want, that's the, you start from this, that's the first level, and the next level, the second level, is this one. You can keep on going like this forever. So you take the intersection and you get the limit set again. And this is interesting from a mathematical point of view because you, when you have infinitely many symbols to code information, then you get some sets, you are capable to deal with some dynamical systems that are different from the TED map, for instance. Okay, so to put it in mathematical terms, for those of you who are acquainted with this, the, if you look at the Cantor set, we all know that the Cantor set is a compact set means something for mathematicians, compact. But when you have infinitely many symbols, then you lose compactness. And the loss of compactness is something that is extremely difficult to handle. And therefore, the, these techniques that have been uh, introduced to look at this uh, infinite uh, symbol situation, uh, they've been done so over the last 15 years only, and mainly done by uh, two of my former colleagues at uh, the University of North Texas, uh, Dan Baldwin and, and Mario Shomansky. So this is really, really deep, uh, uh, deep and advanced analysis that you need to do that because, again, you lose, you lose compactness, you have to deal with infinitely many maps, so to control the situation, this is uh, very, very difficult indeed. So we need some new techniques, and that's why this is part of the interest in doing this. And as I was saying earlier, the other thing that is of interest right now is to try to do something like this, but introduce some randomness in there. So instead of having always the same maps at every level, you just have some, some maps at every level, but there's an aspect of randomness in there. So that, that, that uh, uh, distorts a little bit the picture at every level. But in the end, you get something that is looking a little, a little bit like the, the non-random case. But then it's, you know, thanks to randomness, you get brand new effects. And uh, this concludes this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Does anyone have questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> No questions? <laughs> José? On peut en français, oui. Oui? Bon, à la fin, là, les fractales, ça peut... Bon, c'est ça, c'est infini, tout ça, mais moi, je comprends pas... C'est quoi l'application, là, pour encoder l'information? Pour euh, coder l'information? Oui, En utilisant quoi? Les fractales, en effet. Ah, les fractales, non. Dans, dans, dans le cas des fractales, c'est tout à fait différent. L'application des fractales, c'est plutôt pour... Euh, faire du, euh, du euh, qu'est-ce que c'est en français c'est de la génération d'images oui oui ça je sais ça oui ok mais, mais, ça, mais je pensais que tu aurais pour coller l'information ah, okay. non, non, non non il faut il faut vraiment que tu aies pour, pour coller l'information tu as tout simplement parce que tu as des limites physiques lorsque tu veux coder l'information des limites que tu n'as pas lorsque tu le fais du point de vue mathématique du point de vue mathématique tu beaucoup plus de possibilités, plus de flexibilité, mais du point de vue physique, tu ne peux pas faire ça parce que euh, si tu regardes le, le, le cas du codage de l'information, ben, tu as juste 0 et 1. Le seul moyen que tu peux procéder, c'est avec du courant électrique. Donc, euh, tu fais juste renverser ton courant. Donc, euh, en renversant ton courant, tu viens, tu viens, de, tu viens de lire la, le, le symbole 1, mais c'est vraiment ta seule possibilité de le faire. Um. Is there a parallel between what happens with fractals and um, Fibonacci series in nature? In nature, there are, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. natural phenomena which uh, follow the Fibonacci series. Is there something similar in the case of fractals? Absolutely. Absolutely. Tout ce qu'on qu observe, effectivement, c'est qu'il y, y, y a toutes sortes d'applications euh, de tout ça. Euh, que ce soit du point de vue symbolique, euh, avec les zéros et les 1, ou même en utilisant les fractales, on peut effectivement appliquer ça. Euh, bon, toute, toute la question de, de, de la suite de Fibonacci avec, euh, avec ses rapports, euh, 
donc le, le golden number, le nombre d'or, euh, tout ça, c'est relié à ça, effectivement. Mais c'est un peu plus... Euh, euh, c'est plus difficile à expliquer. Donc, euh, euh, c'est que quand on veut coder les, quand on veut coder l'information, qu'est-ce qu'il nous dit? Bon, c'est une question que je n'ai pas adressée pendant l'exposé, mais qu'est-ce qu'il nous dit qu'on a un bon code ou un mauvais code? Alors, Évidemment, il faut tenir compte de, des capacités de notre système. Donc, ça veut dire, euh, il y a la, la question du, du médium magnétique, donc le milieu magnétique qui, qui entre en jeu. Il y a la question de euh, la tête, donc, euh, qui, va, qui va lire au moyen du courant. Donc, il y a une, sen, une sensibilité de l'électronique qui entre en jeu, de part. Mais qu'est-ce qui fait qu'un code est meilleur qu'un autre? Ben, il faut, il faut que le code puisse nous permettre d'éviter de commettre autant d'erreurs que possible. Et pour ce faire, bon, il y a toute une théorie, qui est la théorie de l'information, qui, euh, qui entre en jeu dans tout ça. Et c'est relié à ça. Alors, on peut montrer, par exemple, que si on prend quelque chose comme ceci, euh, alors lorsqu'on le fait du point de vue mathématique, on peut partir... Il y a la théorie des graphes qui revient à tout ça aussi. Euh, donc, si on part de 0 et 1, et que, euh, disons, je, je place, on utilise des boules pour désigner des sommets, on peut faire la chose suivante. On peut créer des, euh, on peut créer des codes qu'on veut, essentiellement. Donc, ce qu'on peut faire, c'est qu'on peut dire, bah, par exemple, euh, 1 peut être... Euh, euh, OK, disons que je vais dire, OK, 1 peut être suivi de, de lui-même, dans mon code, euh, peut être euh, suivi de 0 et 0 peut être suivi de 1, mais 0 ne peut pas être suivi de 0. Alors, tout ça, ça crée un système dynamique symbolique lorsqu'on crée toute la, tout, tous les mots infinis que l'on peut construire avec ceci. Et euh, l'intérêt, c'est de savoir, c'est de savoir pour, pour certaines raisons, c'est de savoir comment est-ce que le nombre de mots s'accroît avec leur longueur? Pour une certaine raison, c'est une quantité qui est importante, et lorsque l'on calcule cette quantité-là, bon, le nombre de mots augmente évidemment avec la longueur des mots, ça c'est clair, c'est même clair qu'il va augmenter de manière exponentielle. Donc, pour cette raison, il faut prendre un logarithme pour tuer, euh, tuer la croissance exponentielle, mais une fois que c'est fait, on obtient un certain chiffre, et ce chiffre-là nous dit quelque chose à propos du système. Il nous dit si on a un bon système ou un, un, on a un mauvais système, jusqu'à un certain point. Et euh, dans le cas de ce simple graphe-là, si on fait le calcul de cette quantité-là, ce qu'on appelle l'entropie topologique, ce qu'on obtient, c'est que c'est euh, le log du euh, nombre d'or. Alors, le nombre d'or est relié à quelque chose comme ça. C'est un, euh, un peu extraordinaire, mais euh, effectivement, ça, vient, ça, sort, ça sort de là. Alors, ce système-là, pour, pour cette raison-là, ce système-là est appelé le, le « golden mean shift ». C'est le, le décalage relié au nombre d'or. Donc, il y, a, il y a toute une, une connexion entre, entre tout ça, évidemment. Donc, qu'on le fasse du point de vue symbolique ou qu'on le fasse du point de vue... Euh, carrément du point de vue réel ou complexe, où on obtient des... Dans ce cas-là, on obtient vraiment des fractales. Euh, oui, il y a un lien avec les, les suites de Fibonacci, euh, le nombre d'or qui est relié à la suite de Fibonacci, et ainsi de suite. Donc, nécessairement, il y aura effectivement dans la nature des phénomènes qui, sont, qui auront pour structure ce genre de réplication à Ben, c'est-à-dire que... <rire> C'est-à-dire que dans la nature, les, les, les phénomènes ne vont pas exactement suivre oui. ça, mais ils vont l'approximer. Oui. Donc, on obtient de bonnes approximations. Si vous avez, par exemple, dans quelque chose qui est légèrement différent de ça, il faut travailler, ici je travaille du point de vue discret. Euh, si on travaille du point de vue continu, on obtient ce qu'on appelle des, des manifolds. On a le stable et unstable manifolds. Et il est démontré que quand on fabrique des bonbons, les bonbons à la mélasse, que euh, la machine suit les euh, stable et unstable manifolds. 
Donc il y a un lien, évidemment, le, c est, c est pas, elle suit, mais pas exactement, elle le suit du point de vue physique. Donc c'est une, une excellente approximation de ce qui se passe. Et il, y a, il, y a beaucoup, il y a beaucoup d'applications de, de tout ça, euh, du point de vue symbolique, comme on voit. De toute façon, la, la création du, du disque compact, c'est en partie grâce au nouveau code que nous avons. Donc c'est une création à la fois physique, parce qu'on a le, la technologie laser qui entre en jeu, mais aussi une création mathématique, parce qu'on code l'information de manière différente. Donc, euh, donc oui, c'est la part des deux, mais euh, lorsqu'on fait des mathématiques, il ne faut pas s'attendre à ce que les modèles que nous construisions reflètent la nature identiquement. Et ce sont, ça demeure des modèles, et on essaie toujours d'obtenir de meilleurs et de meilleurs modèles, mais ils ne nous donnent que une idée approximative. Descartes avait pratiquement réussi, mais pas tout à fait. Non. Et il ne le sera jamais de toute façon. Pardon? Il ne le sera jamais de toute façon. Ah, non. non, parce que le, il, y a des, il y a des lois intrinsèques qu'on ne peut pas euh, ben, qu'on peut pas décrire de ce, au moyen de, de fractal mathématique pour décrire un fractal physique. Bon, alors un grand merci à Mario pour euh, nous présenter ce sujet compliqué en termes compréhensibles, <rire> les noms mathématiciens. Merci à tout le monde pour, pour venir et, et tout. Alors merci beaucoup. Merci.